Well, good morning. <coughs> My name is David Biet. Um, I'm director of the center's new polar initiative. Um, we're officially official now, having gotten the go for June 1st, and we're already off to a running start. Um, we're going to start the program now, waiting for our third speaker, who I uh, trust will show up. Um, but for those of you who are here and those of you who are on the webcast, this is being webcast live. The Wilson's Woodrow Wilson International Scholars is the United States' official memorial to the 28th president. It was founded by an act of Congress in 1968 as a nonpartisan policy forum to promote independent research and open dialogue with the goal of informing actionable ideas for Congress, the administration, and the broader policy community. In that context, the Polar Initiative fosters discussion and research on Arctic and Antarctic issues. We look at a variety of topics, including, but not limited to, environmental, economic, human security, which is a topic of today's, uh, subject of today's program, <laughs> energy, maritime, scientific, and security challenges in the polar regions. I encourage you to sign up for our mailing list and to follow us on Twitter, at, at Polar Initiative, <coughs> and on Facebook. Today's program is built on the foundation that there are actually people who live in the Arctic. And I know many of you have heard this before, but it's surprising how many people realize <coughs> or are stunned that there are actually four million people who live in the Arctic. <coughs> Often we think of the <coughs> um, fur-trimmed uh, parka of the, es the Eskimo on the cover of National Geographic, and that's what we think of the Arctic. But there are people who live there who lead lives who have issues with uh, daily life, with employment, with uh, economy, and with the government. So today we're looking at two cases of human security in the Arctic through the Alaska experience in the United States and through the Nunavut experience in Canada. I expect as the Polar Initiative grows, we will investigate other regions of the Arctic as well. So Anita Parlow, to my far left, our discussant, will begin the program with a brief overview of the issue setting the stage, if you will. Anita has most recently worked on the Harvard-MIT Fisheries Project and is about to begin some work in the Northwest Territories relating to the exploitation of natural resources in the context of protecting subsistence hunting and farming. She has considerable experience in corporate social responsibility, energy development, and crisis management. Following Anita, Anthony Speka joins us from Iqaluit to discuss our topic from the Nunavut and Canada perspective. Anthony is founder and managing principal of Polar Aspect, a consultancy focused on public policy, strategy, and negotiation in the Arctic. He is a former senior official with the government of Nunavut, where he oversaw Nunavut's fiscal and economic policy and annual economic outlook, and served as an advisor to the Minister of Finance on fiscal relations with Canada. And we hope that our third speaker, Craig Fleener, <coughs> will arrive soon. Um, Craig will discuss the Alaskan experience in the United States, and I'm pleased to <coughs> um, have him. He's uh, the Arctic Policy Advisor to Alaska Governor Bill Sullivan. Craig previously served as Director and Deputy Commissioner of Game, Subsistence, and Habitat for Alaska's Department of Fish and Game. He served on the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments from 1991 to 2007 as a project coordinator, environmental manager, wildlife biologist, natural resources director, and eventually executive director. So after our two speakers, Anita will retake the microphone to discuss their presentations, and then we'll open the floor to discussions. Um, and I hope you all participate. And for those of you watching the live ca webcast, if you do have questions, please tweet them to at Polar Initiative, and we'll get your question asked. So over to you, Anita. <coughs> Thank you much, David. And, uh, Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being here and for those who are online. And uh, it's an honor indeed to be here. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to read my. Thank you. I'm going to uh, read my remarks because I'm trying to keep myself from going off track. Uh, and uh, as David mentioned, my remarks are introductory in nature to provide context. And then uh, after Anthony and hopefully Craig uh, speak, we'll have a bit of a dialogue. And then David will be asking questions uh, of you all. So um, to note, as a matter of climate change, geostrategic considerations, and war and peace, the headlines and realities behind them leave little room to pause and think. Press accounts of ISIS, Yemen, waves of refugees, many children from Syria over the borders to Turkey or Jordan, Yazidi beheadings are worse, Kurdish separatists bombed by Turks yet as they fight ISIS, Rohingyas stranded in phantom ships seeking asylum, or hundreds of thousands who cross the deserts of North Africa or the Mediterranean to find hope. 
There's seemingly a nonstop connectivity amongst all of us who live on the planet. Seemingly remarkably, in the recent past few years, the top of the world, the Arctic, has broken through, receiving attention in its own right. International organizations such as Greenpeace with photogenic submersibles and polar bear suits sings, seek strong climate action by the Arctic states, establishment and management of marine protected areas, improved technologies for petroleum development in the offshore, and protection of marine ecosystems and fish stocks from destructive fishing. Kayaktivists in offshore Seattle recently tried to stop a Royal Dutch Shell drill rig from moving to its optic, Arctic operations in the Chukchi. And again, more recently in Portland, Oregon, where Shell's gouged icebreaker returned for repairs. There's a global imagery that has dominated the Arctic, be it the pristine, untouched Arctic of Amundsen, Peary, Hudson, Nansen, Mackenzie, Bering, or Chillingaroth, or the land of subsistence practiced by the elders and leadership of the Sami, Nanets, Kanti, Chukchi, Aleut, Yupik, Inuit, Diné, Gwich'in, Inupia, and others, whose very way of life is on the line. The Arctic appears to teeter between expressions in romantic terms, spiritual powers, or as Charles Emerson, who recently quoted Nansen, the spiritual power to redeem the ills of the modern world, while in perhaps its opposite, a source of future prosperity. Much has been said and written about the impacts of global warming in the Arctic context, whether it be melting permafrost, warming waters where fisheries are moving northward, entire communities like Alaska's Shishmarif falling into icy waters, washed away by seas no longer stopped by ice flows, or the potential increased viability of commercial interests, shipping, offshore oil and gas development over the, nec over the next decades, and the potential opening by new fisheries, assuming the marine ecosystem habitats can keep pace with the trajectories of the moving fish. The Arctic-wide stories are told are told, the Arctic wise stories that are told are generally broad based, large, quite often true, but to some extent beside the point. For as we know, there is no one Arctic, there are many Arctics. So offshore delineations, whether by customary law or codified in UNCLOS, reflects a long standing tension between the rights of the coastal states and the freedom of navigation and fishing in the high seas beyond the state controlled waters, yet still frozen. As the 1982 convention set out the rights and responsibilities of coastal states and non-coastal delineations of internal waters, territorial seas, contiguous zones, exclusive economic zones, and the continental shelf comprising the seabed and the subsoil of the natural prolongation of the coastal states, land over which the coastal state has sovereign rights to exploit the natural resources found there. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, off-quoted, some 80 or 90 percent of all offshore oil and gas lies within the outer continental shelf regions of the Arctic nations, and the estimated amount of offshore oil and gas counts for about one-third of the world's recoverable carbon resources. With warming and increased use of oceans for fishing, resource exploration, and shipping, the dynamics and issues themselves are changing, which are likely to draw upon a wide, ranging, wide range of advice-giving, treaty-making, and policy-making functions regarding oceans. However, the creatures that live in them know little of the political and sovereignty issues of those who maintain jurisdiction, a question for consideration. Which brings us to terrestrial <coughs> concerns. While there may be a convergence of pan-Arctic concerns, environmental, commercial, human, Canadian journalist Ed Struzik writes of what he calls the post-Arctic world, or more ominously, the end of the Arctic, to describe our historical and geopolitical moment. But whatever the large scale geopolitics, and even perhaps to draw from what so former Soviet Premier Gorbachev in his Murmansk speech called a zone of peace that ultimately led to the creation of the Arctic Council, it is the many Arctics, the relationship between federal, state, territorial, provincial, and tribal interests that are certainly impacted and giving the Arctic its real meaning and real dynamics. And despite the fact that the Arctic nations pledged to fully integrate the Arctic part of the Arctic nations in the development of Arctic policy, be it Canada, the United States, the Russian Federation, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Greenland, Iceland, or Finland, hope I haven't forgotten anyone, it, it is often said to be difficult to find a sympathetic ear. In the U.S., as President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry prepared to meet up with Alaskans and others in the Arctic Circle meeting to be conducted in Alaska, Senator Lisa Murkowski has strongly criticized the administration for its exclusion of Alaska's wildlife national refuge, proposed limits on offshore leasing, and in the natural National Petroleum Reserve as, quote, declaring war on Alaska's future. Balancing opposites is certainly not easy and not likely to stop. 
Our next speakers, remarkable each in their own rights, uh, will discuss the regions of the Arctic, or at least for now, Anthony. Um, <laughs> uh, and unlike Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, are far less developed and maintain uh, far less infrastructure. Miskowski has also said, really, there are two Arctics. There's the developed Arctic of the Nordic countries, and then there's the United States, uh, Russia, uh, Canada. And unlike Russia, uh, far less national focus on the role of the Arctic in the economic and political life of the nation, quite distinct from the Alaskan and Nunavut points of view. And uh, so I'm uh, delighted. I hope that uh, I've done you justice, um, Anthony, and look very much forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. OK. As you've heard, my name's Anthony Specker. I come to you from Akhaluit Nunavut, which is the capital of Nunavut on Baffin Island. Um, it was a long way to get here, <laughs> and it cost a lot of money. And that will become important uh, in what we talk about, in what we talk about over the next uh, hour or so, about the human security and economic and human development of the Arctic. Um, there are many Arctics, um, and so there should be many people here. And I hope that we do get our next speaker. But if it's all right, I'll just sort of go, go on. without yep. um, sort of looking at my watch at this point. Is that okay? You don't have to look at your watch. Okay. We'll, we'll work it out. <coughs> Terrific. Well, thanks, firstly, to you, David, and to the Wilson Center for the invitation to participate here. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I'm extremely glad to be here, especially because of the topic that we're discussing today, human security and development in the Arctic. This is a pressing subject. For me, this is the pressing subject. But it's at least as much, in my opinion, if not more important uh, than breathless news coverage of uh, who owns the North Pole, um, Will there be conflict with Russia in the Arctic? And that perennial chestnut, where did that other ship of the Franklin expedition actually get to? So it is important to say up front, and, and Mary has said it, that the Arctic is a huge region with uh, a huge region of the world with enormous regional variation within it. There are many different Arctics, as we've just heard, uh, and there are going to be many different uh, pers perspectives on human security and development. So I will be focusing here on the Arctic that I know best, or the part of the Arctic that I know best. That's the Eastern Canadian Arctic, specifically the territory of Nunavut in Canada. Um, and just to give you some perspective, it's a young territory. It was created in 1999, so it's only 16 years old as a government. Uh, previously, it was part of the Northwest Territories. It's about 20% of the land mass of Canada, Canada being the second largest country in the world. So we're talking about 2 million square kilometers, approximately. Uh, that's about 25% bigger than Alaska. You could fit three Texases, three states of Texas in Nunavut. Um, it's virtually all above the tree line. So in the Arctic, by anyone's definition, whether climatic or political, um, but it only has about 35,000 people in it, not enough to fill a sports stadium, spread out between 25 fly-in communities, uh, none of which, that what I mean, is accessible by road. You either have to fly there or take a boat there when the sea is not frozen, uh, which, is not, uh, which is less often than it is in the year. 85% uh, of the people of Nunavut are Inuit. So Inuit and Aboriginal people, the Inuit, make up the vast majority of Nunavut's population. But politically, what you need to know about Nunavut is that the Nunavut government is not an Inuit government. N the territory of Nunavut was created um, out of a land claims agreement with the Inuit, but the government is a public government. Constitutionally, Nunavut is the same as the Northwest Territories or Yukon. It was created by an act of parliament, and the government represents, though the government, for example, the politicians are Many of them are Inuit, and their constituencies are 85 or, or whatever percent Inuit. Uh, the government of Nunavut represents all Nunavumut, uh, whether Inuit or not, uh, living within the territory. The other thing that you need to know, that besides that it's not an Inuit government, but rather a public government, is that it is a creature of the Canadian Parliament. It is a territory and not a province, which means it has no inherent sovereignty. It has no part of the Canadian crown. It exists as I said, through an act of parliament, and has all and only those powers which the Canadian government is willing to grant it. Okay. 
that's going to become important later on as well. Now, I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, a magic lantern show for you. I'd rather tell you some stories. That's how I'd like to approach the, quest the question of human development, uh, th through a series of sort of stories or examples, not of individual people, rather, but about stories about Nunavut and what Nunavut is like and how it got to the way it's, it, it, it is. Um, so my ultimate focus here is not going to be on practical policy prescriptions. I've, I've written uh, about practical policy prescriptions and I'm happy to discuss them in discussion or give you a link to the articles where I've made policy prescriptions, all of them ignored, I just don't know why, by the federal government. But um, uh, as I said, we can talk about that but rather, what I would like to do, instead of talking about practical policy prescriptions, is make a plea for a change of mindset about the North, um, and about Nunavut specifically, and perhaps by extension to places like Alaska or other places in the Arctic, but it, a change of mindset that I think is fundamentally necessary to remove obstacles to uh, human development and human security in the Arctic, and to make any further progress on human security and development in the Arctic. And why, why do I want to take this approach about a change of mindset rather than practical policy prescriptions? Um, it's because I think there is a moral dimension to this question, a moral dimension to the question of human security and development of the Arctic that cannot be addressed simply with an economist's sort of technical solution. And so I want to, I want to sort of pull on your moral sense here a little bit with my stories uh, and challenge you to change perhaps the way you look at the Arctic, or maybe you're already there with me and I'm preaching to the converted, which would be great, but, uh, to get you to see the sort of the moral dimension uh, of the question that we're talking about. Okay? So to set the stage, let's talk about underdevelopment in a, for a minute. Underdevelopment in the sense of resources not being used uh, to their full socioeconomic potential, let's call that underdevelopment for a minute, that is chronic in Nunavut. This is true of much natural capital in Nunavut, which is stranded because it's difficult, Nunavut is difficult of access. I mean, Nunavut is basically uh, blessed with virtually everything that you could think of to dig out of the ground. Iron, zinc, copper, silver, gold, diamonds, oil, gas, uranium, sapphires, uh, you name it, uh, you probably can find it in Nunavut, platinum, cobalt, nickel. But all of this natural capital is stranded because it, there is no infrastructure, there exists no infrastructure, very little infrastructure um, to, to get at it. What I'm really more focused on, apart from th that sort of that being bit of being underdeveloped, it's underdeveloped because it, this, these resources are not being extracted, this is also true of human capital in the Arctic, that human capital is underdeveloped. Now, you're probably all familiar with the Human Development Index, right, the UN's HDI. Um, that's not quite a measure of human security as it is of human development, I guess, but let's go with that for a minute. You're probably also aware that on this measure of human development, Canada comes out in the top 10 countries in the world alongside, you know, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, those sorts of countries, uh, more often than it doesn't. So Canada is considered uh, a leader, a world leader in human development. When I um, would sit around sometimes with my colleagues at the government of Nunavut, we would ask ourselves, I wonder what the HDI for Nunavut would be. Not Canada, but Nunavut. And finally, a think tank in Ottawa decided to do this exercise for every province and territory in Canada. So we got an HDI for Ontario, an HDI for Quebec, an HDI for Nunavut. And the HDI for Nunavut was really telling. As, as you know, there are, there are three components to the, to the HDI. Um, there's a measure of wealth in terms of GDP per capita. There's a measure of uh, uh, educational attainment, the measure of life expectancy, which is pro proxy for health. And it's the last two that I'm worried about here. On measures of life expectancy and educational attainment, Nunavut was on par with the occupied Palestine and Paraguay, not Canada not Finland, not Iceland. So Canada's HDI is masking a huge human development issue in Nunavut. So bear that in mind, and I want to tell you a story, my first story, about, that helps explain how Nunavut got to this point. 
Um, and so I'm going to take you back to the Eastern Canadian Arctic of the 1970s. This is not Nunavut now. This is, Nunavut didn't exist. It's part of the Northwest Territories. In the 1970s, the last Inuit were moving off the land and into villages, the communities that now exist in Nunavut. These villages uh, were created mostly for the convenience of the federal government to provide quote-unquote public services to the Inuit, um, not for the convenience of Inuit, who were, at many of them at that time, still uh, living a subsistence life. Um, it was also convenient for the federal government to have a place where they could access Inuit for residential schools, schooling, and that sort of uh, thing, um, for which the government uh, is, is still, I don't think, made complete amends. But leaving that aside, let's just think about what moving into communities might mean for a traditional culture that depends on a seasonal round on the land. You're now further away from the animals that you depend on. So in order to continue a traditional lifestyle, or at least a, a partial traditional lifestyle, you have to become a more efficient hunter. So the Inuit didn't give up their hunting life. They became more efficient hunters. How do you become more efficient hunter? Well, you adopt more efficient technology. That more efficient technology was snowmobiles, motorboats, rifles. Those things allowed Inuit to go out and continue to access uh, animals on the land. But those things required money. So now your hunting kit requires money. So you live in a mixed economy, right, where you need money in order to keep up a traditional, traditional culture. Now, fortunately uh, for the Inuit at that time, uh, that money was readily obtainable by selling onto the, the global market uh, excess pelts of seal. The seal, for, especially for the Baffin Inuit, was uh, a large part of the diet. Uh, you were taking more seal than you needed the fur from, so there was excess fur to be sold in the market. At that time, um, one day's hunting could be paid for by a single seal, seal skin. Then, as we all know, uh, countries around the world started banning the importation of seal. Not the seal that the Inuit were hunting, mind you, but the cuddly white pups of the harp seal, which were being hunted in Newfoundland. Uh, there was a large campaign, Greenpeace, for example, uh, and other organizations were spearheading that campaign. We all know about the visits of Brigitte Bardot and others on to the ice, uh, hugging seals um, or spray painting them so that their pelts would become valueless. First, the United States responded. That was 1972 with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which bans the importation of marine mammal uh, parts into the UK, not just seal, but all, all kinds. This was bound up with whaling and polar bears and all the rest. Uh, but that was not so important uh, because the U.S. was never a huge market for seal pelts. It was when Europe followed suit by banning the importation of seal skins in 1983 that things began to go sour. Because you see, despite the fact that the ban included an exemption for Inuit for their subsistence lifestyle, and despite the fact that the ban focused on the pelts of pup, harp seals, and hooded seals, the campaign against sealing tainted, completely tainted, the whole idea of wearing seal. So even ring seal pelts, adult ring seal pelts, from a subsistence harvest became valueless. So whereas, as I said before, a single seal pelt could pay for a day's worth of hunting before 1983, after the ban in 1983, a single seal pelt wouldn't even buy a box of bullets. The government of the Northwest Territories, which was in charge of the Eastern Canadian Arctic at the time, estimated that about 60%, 60% of the income of uh, Inuit communities was overnight wiped out, vanished. These communities were instantaneously impoverished. And that ban uh, still exists, by the way. Um, it has recently been extended. The European Union in 2009 uh, banned seal pelts entirely, not, not just uh, from 
the pups of harps and hooded seals, but just seal pelts generally, still with an Inuit exemption. And again, the market, which had recovered slightly, once again crashed. Um, and I tell this story because not only does it tell you a little bit about why uh, Nunavut's HDI indicators might be so low, but also because it tells you something about the obstacles that we put, maybe as a matter of collateral damage, but the obstacles that we put in the way of human development of the Arctic by pursuing our southern interests, whatever they happen to be, without regard uh, or without enough regard for the kind of damage that, that can do to northern communities. Now think, this is not just an abstract exercise, you know, about talking about the past. Think about now what campaign, what bans are being proposed on Arctic activity. I can think of one prominent campaign right now, Save the Arctic, Greenpeace's Save the Arctic campaign, which would see a ban on oil and gas drilling entirely uh, in the Arctic. To Inuit, the people of the north, this looks like the same mistake again. So if oil and gas, for example, in Greenland, is the path to a self-reliant economy, as many Greenlanders see it to be, if, that, if there were a ban on, uh, if countries applied a ban on drilling oil and gas in the Arctic, we will have, again, put another obstacle in the way of economic development in the Arctic. Not to say that it, people in the Arctic want to see a forest of oil derricks off their shores. People in the Arctic are conflicted about the benefits of oil and gas development, and they're fully aware of the possible consequences. It's just that they want to be the ones to decide how to balance that question, not have it decided by southern interests again in a way that treats their communities as collateral damage in a greater fight for something else. So these are sort of uh, the kinds of things that we should avoid if we want to promote human security and development in the Arctic. We have to listen to the people in the Arctic about how they want that development to happen. We have to stop putting obstacles in their way. So that's one story. That sort of explains sort of how, partly explains how Nunavut got to the point where it is now. Now I want to tell you another story that something that is helping keep Nunavut the way it is with educational and life expectancy indicators uh, on the order of, you know, sort of on par with Occupy Palestine and Paraguay. And not to mince words, I don't know if anyone from the Canadian Embassy is in the audience, the Canadian federal government is not fulfilling its responsibility to the territory of Nunavut. And I'll explain what I mean by telling you a story about how it is that the federal government actually funds public services in the north. The government of Nunavut depends on a block grant from the federal government for approximately 90% of its budgetary spending. As I said, the government of Nunavut is a public government. It is not an Inuit government. The Inuit themselves do not provide public services. It is the government of Nunavut that provides public services on the behalf of all Nunavut, 85% of whom are Inuit. So this is the Nunavut budget I'm talking about. That's schools, that's health care, and medical travel to the south when needed. Those are our, that's policing and justice and housing and economic development and our airports, transportation of all sorts, license plates and driver's licenses, that sort of thing. The government of Nunavut provides all of these services, and they rely on the federal government for 90% of the budget to provide those services. Now, how does the federal government, how does the federal government decide how much money to give to Nunavut every year to provide these services? Well, there's a formula called Territorial Formula Financing, TFF, and it's essentially a gap-filling formula. It makes very good sense. You calculate what is the expenditure need in a given year to provide public services. You calculate what is the revenue-generating capacity of the government of Nunavut itself and you subtract one from the other. And that gap, you just fill up with the grant. Right? So here's the expenditure need. Subtract off revenue generating capacity of Nunavut and fill up the rest with the grant from the federal government. And like I say, that grant accounts for 90% of the spending. So what we're generating is about 10%, our revenue generating capacity. So if you 
if you think about how that formula works, the most important part of it is figuring out what the expenditure need is going to be. Now you'd think perhaps the expenditure need was calculated uh, on the basis of some kind of uh, systematic or scientific kind of enumeration of the things that a government, a prudent government would have to pay for to give comparable public services to its citizens that citizens in southern Canada uh, have, but you'd be wrong. In the 1980s, the early 1980s, when the federal government decided to institute this gap-filling formula, it used to be that a commissioner, the commissioner for the territories, would get um, a set of priorities, spending priorities, from the territorial legislature, which at that time had only existed for about seven years. This is the territorial legislature of the Northwest Territories, and would go line by line and approve or deny each of those spending items. Then what was needed was added up, and that was the grant. Ottawa decided that as part of the development, the political development of the territories, that they should be responsible for spending their own money however they wanted to spend it. So the territorial legislature would just be given a block grant and then they could allocate it to their priorities as they wanted without a commissioner going through and saying yes or no line by line. So how do you figure out what the block grant is? They said, well, what are we spending now? X number of dollars? Well, that's it. That's the grant. That's the need. It wasn't, okay, are we actually spending enough to deliver comparable public services in Nunavut? Um, what do the people in Nunavut, or sorry, this is the Northwest Territories, the Northwest Territories need in order to uh, uh, attain uh, r human security and to develop economically? And it was a simply a question of what was the federal government spending up to that point. And now that number has escalated by population growth and other factors. It has been arbitrarily cut and also uh, boosted, but overall, the core of the block grant is about what the federal government is willing to spend and not what the territory's citizens actually need. So I wouldn't even call it expenditure need. I would just call it, um, you know, what the federal government is willing to see go out the door. If Nunavut's HDI is as I told you, on par with the Occupy Palestine and Paraguay in terms of educational attainment and, uh, and life expectancy, it should be clear to anyone that what the government is willing to spend is simply insufficient to provide uh, comparable public services that other Canadians enjoy. And if you need further data on that, pick any social indicator that you can think of, crime, health, um, uh, overcrowding, tuberculosis rates, uh, uh, graduation rates, all of these are much, much, much worse than they are in southern Canada. Suicide rates are ten times the national average. Uh, One-third of the population is food insecure. Uh, Fifty percent of the territory relies on social assistance. Fifty percent of the households in the territory rely on social assistance in one form or another. Fifty percent are in social housing. In some communities it goes up to as high as eighty percent. Uh, there are no roads. All the airports except for one or two have dirt runways and they are visual landing only. All the power plants are thirty or forty years old and burn diesel. Power cuts are common in some places. Uh, Iglulik has just gone off a boil water advisory because there were harmful bacteria in the water system. These sorts of things, these sorts of social outcomes would not be tolerated in southern Canada. Um, but they seem to have to be tolerated in the north because the federal government doesn't seem willing to fulfill its financial responsibility to the territory to provide comparable public services. So. Why do I mention this in particular? I mention this because if Nunavut is ever going to achieve um, the levels of human security and human development that uh, the people who live in Nunavut deserve, it's going to have to start first with government. Um, and this is important because we often, tend to be talk we often tend to talk about the private sector when we talk about uh, economic development. But the private sector depends on the government having already provided a certain base of infrastructure, of a labor force, an educated labor force, a healthy labor force, and all the rest. 
Um, and the government is simply not doing that in Nunavut. So you're not going to, you're not going to um, get human development in Nunavut uh, simply by relying on market forces. All of that is doomed to fail, really. I mean, I believe in the, in the public sector as much as anyone else. And Nunavut has made incredible strides um, since the 1970s, since those t the times that I took you back to. Uh, they have a land claim with uh, the Inuit of Nunavut have a land claim with the federal government. They are uh, owners of about 20% of the territory, including mineral rights. Um, the territorial government is, uh, is now separate, can make its own decisions on many issues, is negotiating uh, the devolution of resources, lands and resources as well, um, has tax raising powers. All of these things are am amazing achievements. Um, Inuit are pilots and doctors and lawyers and teachers. None of that is, is, is going to change. None of that can be taken away. But there's still a very, very long way to go. And we're not going to get there unless, I think, the government um, stops thinking of the North as a national space where it has local agents, namely the territorial government, to deliver public services as cheaply as possible, and rather thinks of it as an integral part of Canada where citizens deserve uh, comparable services at comparable levels of taxation. Interestingly, of course, that's how the government talks about the North, but the proof is in the pudding. You can talk your vision all you want, but unless you're willing to put your hand in your pocket to make that vision happen, um, it's just so many words on paper, really. So now you might say, well, wait a minute here, Anthony. <clears throat> is it really like, the, is it really just the federal government's fault? Is there, not, is there not a local mindset change needed here? I'm asking for a mindset change. Is there not a local mindset change needed? Now, full disclosure, I used to work for the government of Nunavut, so perhaps I'm biased. Um, but all, and, and all the same, I do know that the government of Nunavut, like any government, can be wasteful with its money and inefficient with its money. There have been uh, overruns on major projects. Um, these things are nothing new to any government, but of course, they're all the more uh, problematic in a place like Nunavut where the money is uh, perhaps not enough to provide the right kind of infrastructure. But I wonder if the government of Nunavut would not be more efficient if it were actually properly funded. I had a staff of 11 in the fiscal and economic policy shop. That staff was never even at half capacity. If I had wanted it to be at full capacity, we couldn't have afforded it, really. We couldn't have afforded it because the money that we were saving on staff was being used for other things. So I think, really, um, there is such a huge gap between what Nunavut uh, needs and what it is provided that the mindset change first has to come uh, from the South, from the federal government, to lay the foundations for true human security and economic development. Now, you also might say, Anthony, um, you know, why this why this emphasis on government here? I know you say that that's the basis for things, but doesn't the private sector have a role to play? Yes, the private sector has a role to play. I agree. Nunavut's private sector is led by construction uh, because there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built, uh, by mining. There are two active mines in Nunavut. Uh, fishing is a future industry that's developing, although um, Nunavut, only, Nunavut interests only have qu uh, two-thirds of the quota, fishing quota, available in their adjacent waters, whereas uh, interests in, in southern provinces, it's always uh, uh, in the high 90s percent. There's another obstacle that's being put in the way of Nunavut's development. Uh, so that's, that's really where the, the economy is, is focused right now. Jobs are certainly needed. Uh, One-third of the population is under 15. Uh, there's a high birth rate, three, over three births uh, per woman. Um, as I mentioned, the social assistance and social housing rates, so jobs are, are definitely needed. But here's the rub. Nunavut is an extremely high-cost location in which to do business. I talked about my airplane ticket getting down here. Anybody want to take a guess? A guess? How much does it cost to fly from Iqaluit, Nunavut, to Washington, D.C.? $10,000. Well, Gosh, they, I must have, con I've convinced a lot of people in this room already, 5,000 is, is a bit high, yeah. Um, it, it's, it is lower than that, it's, it was 2,500 approximately, 2,500, 2,600. Two you can fly around the world and probably stay at a nice hotel somewhere for the amount of money that it took just to get me down here. 
Um, Nunavut is a high cost location because the transport is so costly, because the infrastructure isn't there when you get there. If you're a mining company, you have to build everything for you mine, everything, more or less. Um, if you want to do business in Nunavut, um, you're faced with incredibly high broadband costs and terrible speeds. Um, commercial leasing rates are extremely high because there are not enough buildings, that sort of thing. Um, and the Nunavut economy itself is, is uh, very dependent on imports. So I told you that the federal government provides 90% of our uh, budget. That's about uh, 1.4 billion Canadian dollars a year. But Nunavut's import bill is a billion plus every year. So there's a tide of money that goes into Nunavut and comes back out in terms of buying things, uh, food, fuel, construction materials, all of that sort of stuff has to be brought up. So if you want to do business in Nunavut, let alone live there, you're going to have to be importing uh, probably all of the materials that, you're, that are going to go into, your, into the goods that you're, you're making or the construction that you're doing or whatever. You often have to import labor because graduation rates are at 30%. There are only 35,000 people in the territory, so even if they were quite high, you might still need to import southern labor. So we're talking about an enormously, enormously high cost jurisdiction. So again, in my mind, it comes back to government making, setting up the base m would make it less expensive for the private sector to operate in the territory. So yes, the private sector has a role to play, but I always fall back on the government needs to, to put the platform in place in order for that momentum to, to take off. Now, what, what, what could be done? I mean, what could pop the, the, the government do to help businesses? Well, I've talked about the lack of infrastructure and all that sort of stuff. I mean, should we become like Argentina was in the 1970s and be in, you know, promote import substituting industrialization in the north? Well, that's not going to work because we could never grow our own food. You're not going to be a manufacturing destination, that sort of thing. Should it be an export-led growth on the model of South Korea or Japan? Well, maybe there's room for building northern champions, but think of what the North has to export. It's very low down the value chain. Fish, minerals, uh, oil and gas. Nobody's going to build an enormous smelter in Nunavut because it's so expensive to do that work there. You're going to mine your stuff and get it out and take it somewhere where it's cheaper to refine. Right? You're going to... Uh, get your fish out of the water, um, and it turns out that it's right now there are no fish plants or very there's just one for a small inshore fishery in Nunavut, um, but there are plenty across the way in Greenland or down in Newfoundland. So you take your fish out. Um, so these are this lack of infrastructure. These are these are obstacles um, that we need to remove. So again, I come back to government. Who's going to be able to do that? Who's going to be able to build small craft harbors? Uh, fish plants, that sort of thing, processing plants, it's going to take government help. So, time for a reality check. It's going to take government help. There's a lot that needs to be done. The gaps are huge. The challenge is great. But let's be clear. The Arctic is never going to be the economic center of Canada. The Arctic is always going to be um, on the periphery. In many ways, this is a good thing. Um, being on the periphery has helped preserve a unique culture and a unique environment so far. This is not something that we want to throw away lightly, even as we pursue all guns blazing human security and human development in the Arctic. Um, but what this does mean, the Arctic is never going to be, the Nunavut is never going to be the economic center of Canada, is that Nunavut even the ideal Nunavut, where the government has put that infrastructural base in place, that educational base in place, that health base in place. Uh, Nunavut is still always, I think, going to depend on federal assistance to, to offer public services at acceptable levels. Um, for me, the HDI figures that I told you about, that's all you need to know. The moral case is paramount. But if you need a sort of a cost-benefit analysis, if the federal government of Canada needs a cost-benefit analysis, it should think of what it's paying for, slightly uh, paying for uh, maybe less than it's actually giving in money, but still getting a return on. The example here I want to leave you with is the Canadian Rangers. They are a militia force in the north. Um, they provide military services essentially on the cheap. They provide their own vehicles. They provide their own... Uh, skills on the land, 
Uh, they're issued with a little bit of equipment, and they do sovereignty patrols. They assist in search and rescue, uh, and they help the uh, regular forces when they're on exercise or doing anything up in the Arctic. The government is getting this, I think, slightly too cheaply, but there is a model for services that the North can provide. And the major service that the North provides, that the people of the North provide to the federal government is you might want to think of as a sovereignty service. Canada's claim to the Arctic uh, depends on uh, effective occupation under international law. That effective occupation has always been provided by the people who live in the Arctic. That sovereignty would be strengthened. The healthier those communities are, the better off those people are, the more um, they are integrated into Canada. And that's worth paying for. And what I've tried to argue for you, to you, is that the government isn't fully paying for it because of the, uh, the lack of human security, the lack of human development there. And I think perhaps um, if the government would think um, of what it's getting in return, um, it might be more willing to step up to the plate. The government could also think of uh, the, the cultural benefits, the diversity uh, that Canada uh, gets for having vibrant Aboriginal communities. I think that's worth paying for. But again, I come back to the moral case. These people are citizens of Canada. Nunavumiut are citizens of Canada. The Inuit are citizens of Canada. They deserve public services, uh, comparable public services to any other citizens of Canada. They should not uh, be shortchanged, which is, I'm afraid, what's happening now. So let me, um, let me leave you with a couple of quotes. A former, de former deputy minister of the Arctic uh, was always fond of telling a story about a debate in the Canadian Parliament about paying for a large piece of infrastructure, um, in, uh, a large piece of, uh, of sort of national infrastructure. And there is a, a quote in Hansard, an MP during the debate stands up and he says, why should we be bankrupting Confederation to provide this infrastructure and these services to these people who live so far away? And then he asked people, what, 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 what people, what far away people do you think they were talking about? Is the people of Nunavut or the people of the Northwest Territories? No, this was the late 19th century and it was the people of British Columbia that these MPs didn't want to spend any money on. And they were talking about spending money for the Transcontinental Railroad, the, the railroad that joined East and West and integrated British Columbia into the Canadian Confederation. And now nobody would think that that was a bad investment. Not in the slightest would anybody think it was a bad investment. Not in the slightest would anybody think the people in BC live just oh so far away and Confederation shouldn't concern themselves with them. But people still do think this way about Nunavut and the Arctic. So maybe there's that change of mindset that I was talking about. The other quote I want to leave you with is from Mary Simon, who is an Inuit leader from northern Quebec, um, one of the great Inuit leaders of, of northern Canada. She said, uh, in response to the Harper, uh, the, Cana the current prime minister's uh, northern initiatives, the use it or lose it initiatives after Russia planted the flag at the, at the North Pole, well, we better use our north or we're going to lose it. She said, look, and I'm quoting here you now, four generations. Canadians have professed to be a people of the North. The reality, however, is that the Arctic has been on the margins of Canadian consciousness. Luckily for Canada, the Inuit are always here. Without the Inuit, could we really claim to be masters of the Arctic house? Probably not. So my call is for a shift in consciousness, that consciousness that Mary Simon was talking about, in that moral sense, towards the people of the North, the ones who really live there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> um, and now we want to hear from the Alaska perspective. Um, and Craig's a great person to tell this story. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, and uh, you can tell I'm from Alaska because I'm sweating even in this room. <laughs> and uh, what a 
an honor to follow a very good presentation. I wish I could have heard even more of it because it sounds as if the message between Nunavut and much of northern Canada is uh, very similar to the Alaska message. Uh, we are, I don't want to say the word plagued, that's the only word coming to mind, but we have very similar issues. Uh, if, if you're from the north, they're not necessarily problems. Uh, that's just how things are. But uh, where I come from, it is a different place than where folks down here live. Uh, actually, has any, is anybody from uh, anywhere north? Anybody from Canada or Alaska in the crowd? There's one, two, three. Okay. So has anybody, has anybody lived in the north anywhere? So there's a one or two more. So I, I try to paint a picture of, of where I'm from just to give folks something to think about because most of you have heard on TV or you watch some crazy ridiculous show about Alaska uh, that really doesn't give a very nice picture of, of where we necessarily are from. But think of uh, a, a vast country with the largest coastline in uh, in the United States. We have uh, 6,600 miles of coast, and I think the rest of the country has about 6,000 miles altogether. That's Alaska. Uh, more than 500,000 square miles and about 760,000 people. My hometown is Fort Yukon. It's eight miles north of the Arctic Circle. I live at the uh, convergence of the Yukon and Porcupine Rivers. And uh, my region is about 55,000 square miles, and there are 1,200 people that live there. Just think about that for a little while. 55,000 square miles, not acres, miles, and 1,200 of us live there. And uh, it's a beautiful place. And we have extremes that, that you may never experience if you've never been uh, anywhere outside of this part of the world. We have the highest and the lowest temperatures in, in Alaska. It gets up to 100 degrees in the summertime and uh, down to the, the 80s in the wintertime minus 80s, that is, in the wintertime. Those are the extremes. It doesn't get that way all of the time, thank goodness. Uh, I don't think I could cut enough firewood to stay warm if it did. But imagine uh, a place where it's totally dark in the wintertime with uh, very little light. Uh, my hometown, we get a little bit of light in the wintertime. We get about three hours, including twilight. Uh, in the summertime, it's 24-hour sunlight. Imagine a country so beautiful that in, in the midnight black of the wintertime, you can look up and see the northern lights, the blues, and the greens, and the yellows, the reds, these beautiful hues, and this, this huge electrical storm dancing over your head. And sometimes you think it's so close that you can, if you could just jump a little higher, you can actually touch it, but it's hundreds of miles above your head. Imagine all of the wildlife that lives there, the ducks, and the geese, and the moose, and the caribou, and the porcupine, and the beaver, and all manner of fish. It, this is a beautiful place that I'm from. And we eat all of those things, by the way. Because in, in most of Alaska, like Nunavut and a lot of northern Canada, there aren't any grocery stores, or there are precious few grocery stores. And in this place that I described, the 55,000 square miles, there are no roads. There's no industry. There's no development. And people live a mixed cash subsistence economy. And that subsistence economy means that we must harvest the resources around us in order to survive. It means if I'm going to build a house, I have to go cut those trees down and build that house myself. If I'm going to uh, use the bathroom, I have to build an outhouse. Now, Fort Yukon actually has a sewer system now, but not too long ago, we had to build outhouses. Um, the, the reason I wanted to paint this picture, just to give you a, a general idea of, of what life is like up there, is uh, most folks don't understand. So when we talk about the, the vast differences or how much it costs to get from, from one place to another, uh, in, from Nunavut to here or from Alaska to here, it's outrageously expensive because the, of the tyranny of time and distance because so many things are so far away and Alaska is so vast. Of course, the rest of the country is vast as well. But uh, it's a giant place that's a long way from here. There's very little in terms of infrastructure, very little in terms of development. It's ultra expensive, a very large land base. And, uh, and we have a uh, discussion uh, in Alaska about how we're going to pay for things across the state. How are we going to meet our own needs? And we're blessed 
to have uh, resource wealth. We're, we're blessed to have oil and gas and minerals and timber and fisheries, the things that generate the kind of revenue that Alaska needs to have an economy. If it wasn't for those things, we couldn't have an economy because there aren't enough people to tax. We could tax every one, every dollar that they earned, and we couldn't afford to pay for the kind of government services that we need. So we must develop the resources around us. And this is an important message to share down here because so much of the governing of Alaska or the governing of the North is done by places that are far away, by people who will never be there, people who don't know much about it, people who don't go there, certainly people who aren't from there. And when you think about Alaska, the, what I would ask you to think about is, is not what, what can I do to, to influence the decision making in Alaska, but think to yourself, what can I do to help Craig develop his own policies, develop his own economy? What can I do to help the people of Alaska to advance their cause? Because it's much more important for the people in a place to be involved in the decision making for that place than it is for, for people from outside to make those decisions. Not saying you can't have an opinion, but, uh, and, and your opinion is, is even more important where you live. I wouldn't want to influence a decision making in your hometown, uh, just as I don't want you to necessarily influence the decision making in my hometown. Another problem we have is actually federal, federal and uh, and non-governmental intervention, intervention, yeah, whatever that word is, interventionalism in Alaska. I should have just said overreach, but I was trying to use a fancy word. Uh, we have a, a lot of folks trying to intervene in how we conduct our day-to-day -day business in Alaska. They uh, lay out their own policies. They they lay out uh, strategies for fish and wildlife management, for conservation, for marine mammals for whether or not we should be developing oil and, and gas. And, and you probably hear on the TV all the time, should Alaska develop the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? Should Shell be allowed to drill for oil and gas offshore? Should there be a pipeline built? Should a pebble mine uh, be put into place or, or any of these development projects? Those decisions are best made at home. Now, your support or your, your opinions on those things are, are important. Don't get me wrong. We, we value the opinions of other folks, but we have to, if we're going to have a successful economy in our state, we have to be allowed to develop that economy. And when so much of that economy, so much of the decision making is decided outside, it makes it very difficult for us to be able to sustain the economy that, uh, that you've already heard about, the type of economy and what we need to be successful. Now, even though I told you that, uh, that uh, there are f precious few people that live in my area, the, the 1,200 or so folks that live in, in the Yukon Flats, my hometown, uh, a lot of us actually think it's a little too crowded. But I was just wanting to say that the Arctic is not empty. It is not devoid of life. No matter what you see on TV, no matter what you've heard about vast wastelands, uh, those of us who are I indigenous people, those, those people who live in the Arctic who are not necessarily indigenous but make their livelihood out there would tell you that it's not devoid of, devoid of life and th that there is much going on out there. In fact, uh, the Arctic has had continuous human occupancy in many cases uh, in the exact same locations for thousands of years. There's one community, community in Alaska that actually says it's been in the exact same spot for 10,000 years. And, uh, and the ab abundant human populations uh, that were there and that will continue to be there, those are the people that should be making the decisions in and around their communities. The Arctic is beautiful and it's devastating. It's hot and cold, as I've described. It's light and dark uh, with 24 hours of, of daylight, 24 hours of darkness in part of the state. It's empty, yet it's full of life. It's full of the things that those of us who are from there need to survive. And uh, it, it isn't uh, a vast wasteland. Let's see, I keep stepping off of this. One of the greatest problems that we've had in Alaska, though, is, uh, is not necessarily, and I think I'll take a, a slightly different tact on, on what sort of support Alaska needs to be successful. Uh, I function on a slightly different mindset in, in terms of uh, of the level of government support that, that I think we need. I think what we, we struggle with a lot in Alaska is, uh, especially in terms of climate change or especially in terms of the, the problems that Alaska is facing right now, is uh, that the people of Alaska, and this is actually a problem for around the world, it isn't just the people of Alaska, but if you come from the, the type of uh, a community that I come from where 
adaptation is critically important to survival where you have to adjust the way that you operate in order to, to meet your daily needs. So if a caribou herd doesn't come by your community this week, well, you've got to be uh, adaptable. You have to be able to adjust to go hunting next week or the following week. And maybe the caribou herd doesn't come at all this year. And maybe you have to adapt to harvesting more salmon or more ducks and geese, or you're harvesting more porcupine or more squirrels, whatever it is, you've got to adapt to the, the changes that are around you. And what government has done, and this isn't just, uh, just national government, but it's uh, state government as well. Government in general uh, has limited the human ability to adapt. And there's a, a wide variety of reasons why that's the case. And they're not all necessarily bad but they're certainly bad for adaptation. And some of those changes, uh, of course, are hunting and fishing regulations. It's a perfect example of how we've limited our ability to, to adapt. If we had no hunting and fishing regulations, I know, I, I know you can say, well, there'd be no wildlife left, and that may be true. But when you have uh, a subsistence-based economy where people are dependent on the resources around them to survive because they don't have a grocery store to go to, if you limit their ability to adapt to when the waterfowl come, if you, if you set a specific hunting and, and fishing season, maybe it's 10 days in the springtime, and the ducks and the geese aren't here yet, then you limit the ability of, of people to, to hunt and fish and to meet their needs. If in the fall time, the season pushes further into the year as, as has been happening over the past few years, uh, and you have a sub September 1st through 10th moose season, but now the moose are not available until October, what do you do? Well, you've limited our ability to adapt as humans. And so one of the greatest problems we have with uh, government interventionalism is that they've hindered our ability to adapt to the changes around us. And so what we need is more flexibility. We need flexibility across the spectrum, not just for f hunting and fishing. Another good example is uh, communities that are at risk because of uh, storm surges and the, the disasters associated with, uh, with the lack of sea ice uh, along the coastline in Alaska where we have communities falling into the ocean. Well, the problem there is we've forced communities to be sedentary. A thousand years ago, that wouldn't have happened. If you looked over across the way and you saw the ocean was, was coming to tear your community apart, you'd get up and walk 100 feet that way. Well, you can't do that now when your house is stuck there on a foundation. You can't do that when your, your water and sewer system has you locked into one place. You can't do it with the current land ownership patterns we have that say, well, you can't go across this line or you're trespassing. So we've really harmed our ability to adapt by the current uh, governmental structures that we have, and not just government, but uh, there are a lot of uh, non-governmental uh, type of organizations that, that push for these sorts of things as well. But we have to be able to adapt to the changes around us if we're going to survive as people. I think our greatest problem right now in terms of adaptation is that we're unable to adapt, not that we don't want to. Humans have adapted to change forever, no matter what the change is, no matter if it's temperature, no matter if it's uh, hunting and fishing season changes, no matter if the, a certain wildlife population isn't there anymore, we've adapted to those changes and we have to continue to adapt if we're going to survive. Climate change is not a, a mystery to rural peoples. Anybody that spends any time outside uh, can tell you when there's a change in the climate because they're out there all the time. If you're living in cities and working in high-rise uh, high buildings, it's a lot more difficult for you to notice the changes around you but certainly people that live on the landscape, they understand, they, they have a feeling for uh, what's around them. This problem of uh, lack of adaptation is exacerbated because the decisions are made in, in Washington, D.C., or in Seattle, or in Portland, or in Juneau, Alaska, or in New York. These legislative decisions are influenced by people that are far away that, as I said earlier, don't necessarily have a full understanding of what's going on, but they have a constituency that's pushing an idea that they want imposed on this faraway land. And uh, it would be much better for those of us who are local to those problems to have a much greater impact. Those decisions are, they affect our lives, they affect law, hunting, fishing, resource development, our ability to conserve resources, our ability to even build a little bit of infrastructure is so heavily influenced by people from the outside that we have a difficult time adapting to the changes around us or even to meet our own societal needs. These decisions are made by outsiders, not from the Arctic. They won't necessarily visit the Arctic, yet they want to impose their will on us. Some Alaskan-specific examples. Uh, Alaska has been, 
not before statehood, uh, not before we became a, a territory, but since uh, we, we were a territory, Alaska is definitely built in the territorial mindset. And we've continued with that territorial mindset. We, we still export raw materials because that's our, that's our only resource base. We don't have the, the necessarily the, the land base to, to build a sustainable e economy for many of the reasons that you've heard earlier with uh, the extreme high cost, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of communications, the lack of navigational abilities, the lack of ports, the lack of industry. All of these uh, make it uh, very difficult for us to have a sustainable economy, so the territorial mindset continues. And I think that a, a, a broad solution, and, and the one area that government can be more helpful, the one area that, uh, another area that uh, non-governmental types could be much more helpful is to, to assist Alaska in developing a sustainable economy. And that sustainable economy can't just be focused on a single asset. That single asset that's uh, sustained Alaska since the 70s has been oil. And we need to diversify our economy. Not that oil is bad. We need to develop more oil and gas resources if we have them, and we do. But we need to develop a diverse economy across our state. And another great hindrance to our ability to, to develop those resources is 67% of the state is owned by the, by the federal government. And we have no ability to access the resources there, even though the law in, in many cases allows uh, for the opportunity to develop those resources. In many cases, we're just told no. As a matter of fact, we have a community. We have a couple of communities. Uh, uh, one is King Cove, and the other one is Cold Bay. And the the example of uh, federal interventional intervention. Yes, that word again. Uh, intervention in what Alaska does, uh, and and uh, not just the federal government, but uh, many folks from outside of Alaska. Uh, would prevent us from building a road to connect these two communities. Now, these two, two communities are, I think, about, they need about 12 miles of road. And we have uh, serious problems because one community has a hospital and the other one doesn't. And they're, they're both on an island, on the same island, and uh, they, uh, they cannot get from one community to, to another. And uh, just an example of uh, the tragedy of the situation is, I think, with, within the past week, we had two uh, medevac situations where uh, two people had to be medevac from one community to the other at extremely high cost. Imagine having to fly an airplane in to go to this community that's only 12 miles away to take it to the next community where a hospital is. Well, we would like to build a road to be able to connect those two communities. But there's a, a piece of information that I'm leaving out. The, the fact is that it's uh, within the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, the Secretary of State uh, recently visited and she said that uh, it's more important to maintain the natural uh, diversity of the landscape than it is to to provide a road for health and safety of human beings now to those of us in alaska that's a problem when you are more concerned about protecting a, a population of geese or whatever wildlife population uh, when you're considering the broad landscape of Alaska and the many millions of acres that we have for uh, uh, waterfowl and wildlife to, to go to, yet these two communities that, that have very few other options, I mean, you could say, yeah, why don't they just all move to Anchorage? Well, that's a little narrow-minded and ridiculous. I'm surprised you said it. Actually, I said it. But uh, you could say, well, why don't they just move? Well, these communities have been there for a very long time, and why would we expect them to move? What we would like to do is, is build a road to connect these two communities so that they can have the health and safety uh, that they need, so, so um, they, they can have the, the provisions that they need. Imagine any other country in the lower 48 here. Imagine, excuse me, any other state uh, in the lower 48, or any other country for that matter, being told by a, a federal government you cannot connect your communities for health and safety, for commerce, or for whatever reason you want to, within your own state boundaries. Yet Alaska faces this all of the time. And Alaska has no roads. We have a road that leads uh, basically from the southern tip of, of the mainland of Alaska to the northern tip, and that was, uh, that's primarily for, for oil and gas and, and to connect Anchorage to Fairbanks. And we have uh, two roads that lead out through Canada and uh, a, a little bit of other road network in this huge, gigantic state and a part of the problem with us being able to develop these resources, to develop the infrastructure that's necessary, is uh, the federal government is telling us no. So there's this overwhelming influence by folks from the outside, and, and the, the government is influenced by, by a lot of folks in the lower 48. 
telling them, no, you can't, you can't let those Alaskans build, build a road. It doesn't matter what the reason is. It doesn't matter if it's for health or safety. It doesn't matter if it's for resource development. They don't care. Their, their primary interest is in, is in uh, the fact that it's in, in a national wildlife refuge. Now, Alaska sick, being 67% owned by the federal government, how in the world do we not develop the resources to make communities sustainable? My own hometown of Fort Yukon is surrounded by the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge, the third largest refuge in the country. Many dozens, or if not more than 100 communities in Alaska are surrounded by parks, and preserves, and refuges, and uh, National Forest Service land. And any of those communities that want to be able to develop their resources or to build a road are, are being told no over and over again. So Alaska specific examples of, uh, of how it is tough to survive in this day and age because of uh, intervention from the outside. Infrastructure is the perfect example. I think there are ways that we can get past this and uh, I think that uh, innovation is probably one of the, the best ways to get past this. Now I think we can be creative. I think it, that we can work together. I think that uh, that um, I, I don't think that the federal government or folks from the outside, if they had an understanding, a better understanding of what is going on in Alaska, that uh, they would be so strong to continue to, to push against what happens in Alaska. But uh, the, the reason I bring up innovation is, is for a wide variety of problem solving. And I think this is a, a, a problem solving solution that we could use not just in Alaska, but, but around the world. And uh, many times folks are telling us, well, we don't want you to develop your oil and gas resources because we want to move beyond that. We don't want to develop coal resources because we want to move beyond that. And we want to get to more, more sustainable development practices. And the people of Alaska support that concept, but we don't support it at, at all costs, at, at the cost of everything else. But I think there's a way to get past that, and the idea is innovation. I don't think we spend enough money on innovation. I do think we spend a lot of money telling people, oh, we want you to put up windmills, or we want you to put up uh, solar panels and, and reap the benefits that those provide. But don't forget how far Alaska is away from the folks that manufacture that stuff. And don't forget that we don't have an infrastructure network in order to, uh, to rail uh, these pieces of equipment around, that everything has to either be brought, brought by boat or by aircraft at extremely high cost. And so the, the idea of innovation, and I think this is, an, this is an area that we can all start to work together and put our minds together to, to solve problems that plague us all, especially places where things are ultra expensive, is to put your money, put our money into trying to find a way to bring the cost of renewables down. If we can drive down the cost of renewables to 10 or 15% of what we're currently paying for electricity or, or any kind of uh, energy now, people will buy into it. I, I don't think we would have a problem with it it's spreading, but I don't think we're spending enough time and effort on innovation. As a matter of fact, a lot of our, our research dollars around the, the concept of innovation, and it, it isn't just uh, energy that I'm talking about, it's, it's every field that we, we could possibly have. But I think if we put more of our effort, more of our energy into innovation to drive down the cost of energy, to drive down the cost of renewables, to drive down the cost of building infrastructure, I think we could be uh, much more successful. And I think that's a much better use of, of government or universities and the, the energy of people instead of just telling folks in a faraway land you can or you can't do something. Alaska lacks in uh, in uh, communications and navigation, as I said earlier, which is a problem. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think uh, a solution for Alaska is less federal oversight instead of more federal oversight. Although I do think that there is, there is a problem. I think Alaska, with the colonial mindset that I talked about earlier, I think Alaska has been left off the, uh, out of planning for almost all of the benefits that, that have been received here in the lower 48 the idea of uh, federal highway dollars that stretch, that have created this wonderful road network that, that all of you take for granted, that I take for granted when I come down here, because it's there and you don't have to think about it. But all the way from, uh, from back in the days when the Ohio Valley was developed and they said, let's put in a road going west so we can open it up, so we can develop resources, so we can bring those resources in, and oh, so we can provide a national defense to, to defend our territory. Most of Alaska has been left out of that. We don't, we don't have a, a, a national highway network 
in Alaska that we can be proud of. We, we should have that. We should have our communities connected by, by highway. We don't have a, a railroad network that connects to the resources that we need to connect to, like you all do. And we don't have a, a, a good port network. We don't have a, a good communications network. We don't have a good navigational system network. We don't have a, a good industry network so we can have a, a sustainable economy. You all take this for granted because you have it down here. And, uh, and, and this is, these are the sorts of things that we want and that we need in Alaska. Uh, a big area that is uh, something that we all need to pay close attention to is uh, the, are all of the advances that uh, Russia has been taking recently with the developing of the Russian Arctic military. And the fact that, uh, that uh, Alaska is the, uh, the closest thing to, to Russia. Does anybody know how far we are away from Russia? By the way, the United States? Anybody care to guess? Yes, sir. Oh, you mean the distance? No. Oh, you don't know the distance. 55. 55. That's pretty darn close. Anybody else? 2.6 miles. Alaska has 2.6 miles. You can't see it from Sarah Palin's house, but I got some friends whose houses you can see it from. And Al Alaska is very close to Russia, and the the economic and uh, and national defense efforts that they've put in. <laughs> to make their country stronger, which is what they should be doing, has not been going on in Alaska. And we have, we've neglected this area of responsibility. And the fact that we're actually drawing down military forces from Alaska to the point now where uh, we just don't have much. What we really need in Alaska, what we really need in this country, is a new national imperative for, for Alaska. And the idea that we, we take a look at uh, our infrastructure needs, not only for, for the commerce that I talked about a little while ago, but also for providing for the national defense, which is a federal responsibility. And uh, Alaska is, is painfully close. We're strategically important. We have a very narrow waterway between us and Russia. And oh, by the way, don't forget that Alaska was the only place that was occupied by a foreign power since World War, or in World War II. So uh, Alaska was occupied. We had the enemy on our, on our soil, and uh, many believe we've had the enemy on our soil since then <clears throat> uh, and, uh, because of our, our proximity to Russia. And it isn't that I'm trying to be a warmonger. I'm, a, I'm just a big fan of a, of a good fence between neighbors, and I think we need to have a strong national defense to, to make and keep the United States strong, to, to make and keep Alaska safe, and to help us to develop the infrastructure that's necessary to, to make our state great and our country great. Uh, I think all of these areas fall very well within the realm of, of federal oversight, and those are areas that I'm very happy to work with uh, federal agencies on or other non-governmental folks who want to come to Alaska and wonder what needs to be done there. But the idea of coming in and imposing law or the idea of coming in and uh, dictating where we can and can't build roads, we must be able to develop uh, our state in a way that's sustainable, in a way that's good for Alaska, and then I think that would be good for the rest of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Craig. Okay, now Anita's going to wrap things up and talk about some other things, and then we'll get into some questions. Yeah, I, I think uh, my senses will have a little back and forth here, uh, if that's okay. You guys have said uh, huge. <laughs> Um, you've really uh, driven it home. Need to use the microphone. Oh, sorry. You've really driven it home in terms of uh, some of the specific issues, which interestingly seem to me um, actually in, in a number of dimensions um, quite quite similar. And uh, if I can just ask a couple of preliminary questions, and then one uh, actually that would have to do with strategic tra trajectory. So, if I may ask, with respect to none of it. Uh, was the agreement with Canada basically when you were speaking of the ethical and moral obligation of um, Ottawa to provide at least similar financing uh, to none of it as to the rest of the country in terms of tax dollars uh, and revenues. Uh, so was the agreement basically we extinguish title, you get resources? We have, we have, not, to con we have to not confuse the land claim agreement with the fiscal relationship between Nunavut and Canada. Um, so just to be more clear on this, in 1993, the Inuit of Nunavut signed a land claim agreement uh, with 
the federal government. This is what you might call a modern treaty. Aboriginal title had been recognized in Canada, its existence had been recognized. Uh, and it was recognized that the, the Aboriginal title that the Inuit held had never been defined within the Canadian Federation. Uh, and it was incumbent upon uh, the Crown to negotiate in a sort of a nation-to-nation -nation fashion with the Inuit to define and codify their uh, Aboriginal rights within Confederation. That resulted in the land claim in 1993. That land claim is an appendage to the Constitution. So essentially, there's the Constitution of Canada, and then there are a bunch of land claims and treaties with indigenous people that, that come as a part of it. That land claim included, in one of its articles, um, a commitment to creating a territory in the Eastern Arctic separate from the government of the Northwest Territory, so a separate Nunavut government. Um, but that land claim does not, that, that land claim did not set up that government and does not, uh, it, it is the context in which that government must operate, just like the federal government must operate with that land claim, but the government is a public government. What the Inuit wanted, to some extent, this is the way, um, there, there are many people better than me who can talk about this. This is the way I understand it from hearing from Inuit who were part of the negotiations. Uh, so if I'm understanding correctly, uh, the Inuit would have liked to have been uh, self-governing. So in control of justice, education, health, and all of that, and funded to provide those services themselves. Uh, that was not something that the government of Canada was willing to contemplate at the time. Although self-government agreements have now been signed with other Aboriginal groups, the Labrador Inuit, for example, uh, the Inuvialuit uh, are negotiating theirs right now, and other uh, Dene groups in the Northwest Territories, the Gwich'in, uh, are looking at the same sort of thing. Uh, but the government of Nunavut that was, that was set up was meant to be that government that then would, would deliver those services, but just like any other government in Canada. A public government for all the citizens, all Nunavut, all the citizens of Nunavut, Inuit or non, so 85% and 15%. And that government is funded com utterly separately, completely separately from uh, the land claim. The land claim has, those two things are totally different. The government is of Nunavut is funded through territorial formula financing, as I mentioned, um, and the principle of that financing is the same principle uh, 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 as horizontal equalization between provinces in southern Canada. So the provinces are, are given money from the federal government to equalize their capacities to provide public services. The principle is comparable services at comparable levels of taxation. It just so happens that Nunavut's tax base, you mentioned Alaska's tax base, Nunavut's tax base is tiny. There's absolutely no way that we could, even if we taxed every dollar that Nunavut made, that we could possibly provide public services. It, that, that is, we provide 10% of our own budget. And as I said, that budget is, as we know from our HDF figures, utterly insufficient to provide public services of a reasonable level to Nunavut. Um, so the principle is the same, comparable services at comparable levels of taxation. Um, it's that principle that's not being lived up to. Now, with respect to resources, as I mentioned, the, the government of Nunavut is uh, a, a creature of parliament. It was created by an act of parliament. It has all and only those powers which the Canadian parliament were willing to give it. In contrast to Alaska, they're, they're fairly wide. Um, uh, and with the, in combined with the land claim, the Inuit um, are co-managers of the land and have a say on what kind of de development goes ahead. Uh, there would be less problem, for example, in proposing a road. Um, of, there's just no money to pay for it. Um, so the, 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 the powers are great, but um, the ability uh, to pay for using those powers isn't great. And resources, in particular, were one of those things that the federal government r reserved for itself. Apart from the land that was given, not given, shouldn't use that word, apart from the land that the Inuit now have title to in recognition of their Aboriginal rights, which are property rights, um, which amounts to about 17% of the territory of Nunavut, making the Inuit of Nunavut one of the largest landowners in the world. Um, apart from that land, all of the land in Nunavut is controlled by the federal government. So if I may... 
Um, and so, and we're we're trying to negotiate uh, the devolution of that of that power. That was my question. Right. So, just like w with uh, Northwest Territories and Yukon devolution of power, then uh, is there now in conversation a devolution of authority back to none of it? And would that then mean, like with Northwest Territories and Yukon, that there would be a um, control or d a determination of split of revenue and a and a capacity to manage the resources and take a determination of what development would occur. Yes. So devolution of lands and resources in the north has two components to it. One is the political component, which is the actual the control of uh, land management, making decisions about uh, permitting a road or permitting a mine or permitting any kind of development or even a park, for example. Um, those decisions right now are co-made uh, between the government of Canada and the Inuit of Nunavut as under the land claim. The, the Minister of Northern, uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development in Ottawa makes the final decision, but it's done on a, a, a co-management basis. Um, devolution would put the government of Nunavut in the place of the federal government as the co-manager of the land uh, together with the Inuit of Nunavut. It would also contemplate a split of resource royalty from uh, anything that's taken out of Crown land. That resource split um, in the, has, ne has not been negotiated. Um, the, the political elements have not been negotiated. This is all sort of in the future. But if we look to what happened to the Northwest Territories, um, our cousin just over the border, the Northwest Territories was offered a 50-50 split with the federal government. Um, they were given uh, a boost to their uh, expenditure in order to run the program, and then you know, if there are any royalties, it's a 50-50 split. There was oil being taken out of the Northwest Territories. Mines are operating in the Northwest Territories. Money was leaving the Northwest Territories, so they needed to make this deal. Um, the 50-50 split is subject to a cap. That cap is 5% of the expenditure base. And as we've already talked about, that expenditure base in Nunavut bears absolutely no relation to what it actually takes to provide comparable public services at comparable levels of taxation. So if Nunavut is offered the same deal as the Northwest Territories, which has been now offered to the Yukon, in an idea of perhaps providing a, a, a standard for the North, uh, I think that would be unfair and ungenerous of the, of the federal government considering uh, Nunavut's, uh, uh, Nunavut's problems. The federal government themselves appointed uh, an expert panel to look into funding in provinces and territories, and that expert panel, Ottawa's own appointees, uh, said that considering Nunavut's issues, uh, it's expenditure base is uh, far too low and it needs to be looked at, but the federal government ignored that, that recommendation. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much. And uh, if I may ask, glad you're here. Um, <laughs> um, r r very complex and interesting what you're saying. So there's a federal government, ours, uh, that owns, did you say 67% uh, of Alaska, and then some portion, uh, forgive me, I don't know, uh, that went to indigenous uh, corporations, native corporations. 44 million acres. 44 I don't know what the percentage is. 44 million acres. And, uh, and the balance either in fee or state held land, I would assume. So as, as you uh, deal with a situation which somewhat sounds like colonization, as you might have described it or as I would look at it, um, what kind of a strategy and trajectory does the, has the state been considering? There's been a lot more uh, expression, I think, coming out of Alaska on, on these matters from a a wide variety of post folks, both elected and non. Is there a, a strategy being developed to address these issues uh, that uh, uh, would uh, create a greater capability of the people in the lower 48 and, and the governance to take a determination that people in Alaska have a right to live in the same way as any other state? Did I load the question? Oh, I think I've, I've got it, or at least I have an answer. We'll see if it matches the question. I, I think one of the one of the blessings that we have right now is the fact that the U.S. is the chair of the Arctic Council, which is has brought a tremendous amount of uh, of interest by the rest of the country and, and much of the world on Alaska because Alaska is the, the U.S. version of the Arctic. And so there's an awful lot of interest right now in what's going on in Alaska. And so we're taking every opportunity that we can to educate folks on uh, the great things that are going on in Alaska and then some of the, some of the woes that we have. And I, I think that we are going to use this time as wisely as possible to highlight uh, many of the, the issues that we've pointed out, many of the issues that I didn't talk about that, that you brought up earlier uh, that exist across the North and uh, 
try to highlight those and find better ways forward. Very clearly, we, we can't, uh, there are things that we just cannot do because of the state-federal relationship, but there are a lot of things we can do, and an interesting perspective uh, in Alaska is since we have uh, so many tribes across the state, we have 229 tribes in Alaska, and we have the uh, Alaska Native Corporations uh, that came to uh, being at the at the land claims that was done in Alaska during the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, they're a very powerful force in terms of uh, of what they can accomplish because of the the resources that they bring to bear, the access to federal dollars that that tribes generally have, and so a, a strategy that is really good for Alaska right now is to to solidify the partnership between the state, between the tribes and the corporations, and and to create a, a really solid network and start working together together better. I, I don't think we've done as good a job before uh, when Alaska was in the height of, uh, of resource wealth, when, when oil was selling for a lot more than it is now. Uh, we didn't necessarily need to partner as much, and uh, but we, we needed to, we just didn't do it. And I think because of the, the drop in oil prices, the drop in, in state revenue that's associated with that, is causing us to look at uh, finding ways to partner. But it, it, we've had the need to partner all along to help us solve those problems. Now we're, we're faced with uh, dire financial circumstances that, that bring us to the table. So the, although there's a downturn in the economy, I think a mixed uh, blessing there is that it brings us to the table. And I think, I think that sets us up very nicely for the future in trying to get some of these problems solved. The next part of that is how do we bring the federal government in to not have an adversarial relationship. And that, that's a tough one to work on, and uh, I don't have an answer on that yet, but we're working on it. It's a process, I would think. Um, and then just two other quick questions, one um, on the heels of the federal government part. So you're 2.7 miles away from Russia, and um, so there are sanctions, et cetera, now, uh, but it would seem to me quite logical that there be some kind of trade that could uh, develop question uh, with respect to Alaska and Murmansk or, you know, so parts on the eastern part of the, of the country, it uh, doesn't have to be big, huge trade, but uh, just trade, uh, which used to occur. And uh, so I wonder if there's any uh, consideration or thinking in those, uh, those kind of terms. Well, very much so. Alaska is very interested in a good bilateral relationship with the, the eastern provinces in Russia. Uh, it, it is difficult to work with folks when we have sanctions. There are many Russian folks that uh, have tried to come to Alaska but can't get visas uh, because of what's going on. And so the, the f two federal relationships may be struggling and they may continue to struggle for a while, but we're hoping to, to see past that and, and work bilaterally. In fact, uh, the Arctic Council chairmanship and the many subsequent meetings that will be taking place in Alaska over the next two years uh, will bring a number of folks from Russia. And we're, we're hoping to piggyback other meetings around the Arctic Council meetings to help to improve that relationship. Thank you. And to, to create those opportunities that you were talking about. Exactly, and at some point does that bring in federal money or that, that can be done strictly with your own capacity to generate revenue and um, investment uh, opportunities and that sort of thing? I think the answer would be yes to both of them. I, I can't say specifically about what will bring federal investment. Uh, I'm hoping we get, we get some more federal inv investment, especially if you're talking about uh, partnering with somebody that uh, is across the way because we would need ports or we would need rail or we would need road, all of the, the infrastructure that we talked about that we, we lack a tremendous amount of in Alaska. And some of that would be private investment, I would assume. Most definitely. And, uh, there has been some mention, I'm not sure if this is in the Inuit Circumpolar uh, Conference or just an individual who happens to be a member of it who is Alaskan, but there was some conversation in the context of warming uh, and uh, therefore uh, changes down the next 10, 20, 30 years in terms of oil, gas offshore and sh commercial shipping, et cetera, uh, that similar to the determinations that led to the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, that there is an offshore component that used to be, and or s maybe in some instances still is, but less and less so ice. And so therefore when people went hunting or fishing or whaling or what they did, uh, th there was a sort of a, uh, there was a use uh, a, 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 a subsistence use and traditional use, use and occupancy, basically, arguably. And uh, so in terms of uh, the determinations that are being made for offshore uh, development, 
which Shell is certainly uh, an interesting um, miner's canary kind of thing with respect to all of that. Has there been discussion either within the framework of, of the state or in other capacities that what kind of rights might the uh, native corporations or indigenous peoples have with respect to the lands that uh, the areas on the waters that had traditionally been theirs that might now be utilized for another purpose? Um, well, in terms of how the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was done, it was it was done primarily, and I don't know if it if there's any example beyond this, but uh, with fee simple land. So the the idea that it isn't something that you can own title to, which the the ocean there there is in title as far as I know, and so that is a is a difficult conundrum. But it it this has been talked about uh, a number of times, and in a uh, amongst a wide variety of folks in the Alaska Native community, uh, not just in the north for oil and gas, but in, in the southern part of the state where it isn't icy uh, in terms of subsistence resources. So this has been something talked about for a while, and it is definitely worth engaging on. I, I don't know where we would fall on it in terms of uh, agreement or or I haven't had those conversations myself. It, it's definitely something worth engaging on, and uh, it is it's becoming more and more important to the, the coastal communities for sure. Thank you. And just final question, if I may. Um, you've both uh, spoken about uh, oil and gas and, and, and development and other, other uh, forms as well, uh, as well as um, renewables uh, resources indeed, and also subsistence and the sort of effort to balance very vast territory uh, uh, with uh, uh, relatively sparse numbers of persons. Uh, who are interested in um, uh, in uh, growing and developing like in anybody else in southern Canada, lower 48, whatever. Um, and I, I not notice that, for example, uh, just from a distance in the Northwest Territories in Canada, for example, they spent, uh, I, uh, the government, the, the last couple of years making assessments in the communities. First is, what do you want your future to look like? Um, and so it came down oil, gas, subsistence. And then it was, okay, so if we're going to do those two things, how do we do that? How do we do that in a responsible manner? And as you pointed out, I believe um, using technology in a way not to just get the stuff out, but get the stuff out if possible in a safe uh, and environmentally uh, uh, appropriate manner. So are these, are these sorts of things in the context of uh, whether it's Alaska or none of it that are, are uh, uh, sort of strategically being thought in terms of policy that you put these two pieces together and you see how does that work? How do we make that happen? Thank you. Well, I don't think that, that anyone in Alaska, maybe maybe nobody anywhere in North America anymore is is contemplating any kind of resource development without some environmental consciousness and thinking about those things. And very clearly, Alaska is a beautiful place, and uh, we want it to stay that way. We want to have access to, to fish and game resources forever because we all depend on them. And it is it is so critically important, hunting and fishing, subsistence, all of that is so critically important that it's codified in our constitution, that it's it's talked about uh, almost daily in the news, that to make sure that we're ma managing in a way that's appropriate and managing in a way that provides abundant fish and game resources to people. So that's critical. At the same time, developing our, our natural resources for, for uh, the development and sustainment of our economy is critical. So we've had those those conversations forever, and we're going to continue to have them. They work hand in hand, and will continue to in Alaska. I think it. I think it's fair to say that it's similar in Canada. Um, as I said before, nobody wants to see nobody in the Arctic or out of the Arctic wants to see the Arctic environment damaged or harmed by development of any sort, whether it be overfishing. Uh, or uh, mining tailings or oil and gas spills, that sort of thing. Um, the question of how does one balance um, environment and development is multifaceted and will depend a lot on particular the particular projects uh, that are occurring. The, I think the, the, the real question for, um, for people in the North is who is making that decision? And as Craig pointed out, it's important that the people who are living there uh, are making that decision and involved in making that decision. It, and that is what's contemplated in, in the land claim, that the Inuit uh, of Nunavut are co-managers of the land. No one needs to tell them how important 
uh, hunting and fishing and subsistence rights and wildlife are, they will be the best defenders when it comes to uh, running the environmental assessments uh, and needing to be consulted, which is, which is their right in Canada, uh, uh, making their voice heard. Um, what they don't want, um, and this would be a sort of like interventionalism or a kind of uh, a, a pseudo-colonialism, is for others uh, from the South to try to interfere with that system that took so many decades to negotiate with, with the federal government and to put into place. Um, let that co-management system work uh, and let the people who are local be um, making the decisions um, and I think what you will get is a balance, at least the, the balance that those people want, which is I think the most important thing. Well, thanks Anita. I think we have time for a few questions and what I'd like to do is collect the questions and we'll kind of answer them all together. First let me check with Spencer, are there any? Okay. So I've got two in the back, I uh, said so the woman in the white and the gentleman with the glasses and then blue and then over here. So, and the uh, microphone, so. Uh, Vadim Malan, uh, Voice of American News, Russian Language Department. Uh, the question is, uh, do you think to any of the gentlemen who could uh, say his opinion, uh, do you think there is a country, there is an Arctic country which is putting the best efforts in human security and development and that could be an example to others. Thank you. Okay, best efforts. Next. Hi, Alicia Rose, NHK Japan Broadcasting. Um, the U.S. government recently announced the Glacier Conference, the Global Leadership in the Arctic. Uh, I was wondering what you believe the importance of the conference is and why now? Okay, uh, up here, in the blue shirt. Arthur Mason, Rice University. As for Greg, what's the role of, you see the role of uh, permanent fund in these partnerships or in these tales of woe uh, surrounding the need for infrastructure, et cetera? And pass that across. Can you pass, Barry, you want to? Uh, Barry Rabe from the Wilson Center and the University of Michigan. On the resource question, it's been intriguing for me to visit other American emerging petrostates, places like North Dakota, that are expressly deciding not to adopt the Alaska model. They want a diverse mix of taxes, many of which Alaska has refused to adopt because of the heavy surges of revenue. As they think about trust funds, they don't want a dividend because they don't want to lose that revenue to think about longer term in investment. Since Alaska has been really locked into this model for almost 45 years now, is there a need to revisit that, especially given the dire fiscal straits that the state faces, or is that really the path forward uh, for, for, for Alaska and, and for, for none of it in other states? Okay, um, four questions. I took notes, but if, if uh, best efforts of Arctic countries, the Glacier Conference, the Permanent Fund, and Alaska. So, brief answers. On all four, I'm, I don't. I, I'll no, 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 you don't have to answer. Off, answer what you will. All right. So I'll leave the Alaska questions to oh, the Alaska. <laughs> so I, I, yeah. permanent fund. I wish we had a permanent fund in Nunavut. Um, best efforts. Uh, Nunavut often look across the water to Greenland as a place uh, where um, human development is is more has been better secured. Um, I'll have to. I have to preface this by saying I don't think that there is any country in the Arctic that has uh, fully taken seriously uh, the fact that there are uh, citizens of, of, of that country living in the Arctic and, and who deserve to have uh, the kind of life that at least you know, rural people in other parts of that, that country live. But um, I'm, I pick on Greenland only because as a contrast to Nunavut. Now, Greenland is uh, looking towards independence, Nunavut is not. Um, the processes of decolonization in Nunavut and Greenland are quite different. For Greenland, it's going to end up, or many Greenlanders would like to see it end up with Greenland taking its place amongst the family of, of, st of independent nations. Uh, for Nunavut, uh, the end game is uh, a maturity, its place uh, within the Canadian Confederation. Um, but the, the da Dan Danish crown and the Greenlandic government have agreed on an actual a fiscal path to get Greenland to 
uh, independence if that's what Greenlanders decide they, they want. And that fiscal path matches the political vision. It's a Greenland essentially takes uh, half of resource revenues until it replaces the block grant that it's getting from the Danish crown, at which point all resource revenues remain with Greenland. So you have a political vision and a fiscal roadmap to get you there. In Nunavut, you have a political vision of vibrant, healthy northern communities, um, but n the fiscal uh, relationship between Nunavut and Canada does not support that in the slightest. So I think that's something, for example, um, that Canada could learn from Greenland about how to do things better. I I'd like to follow up on that question. I think that there is a little bit to learn from many countries across the Arctic, and uh, I don't know if any one country has it has it all worked out, but uh, Alaska is envious of a number of things that have uh, taken place across Canada. One example is, it, and it may not necessarily be this way in Nunavut, but uh, clearly the infrastructure that uh, the Canadian government has invested to connect the communities. Uh, in Yukon, there's only one community not connected by road, and, and they're just as far north as we are. So granted, they're a lot smaller and far fewer communities, but uh, the idea of, of their infrastructure is very nice. Uh, many of the Scandinavian countries have uh, been in existence for a long time and have developed an awful lot of uh, their economy to, to live in the, the environment that they have and, and have done a, a very good job of it. So I, I think that there is a, a lot to look at in envy uh, in different parts of the world. So I, I, I don't think I've reviewed it in enough detail to be able to, to pinpoint just one example. Uh, on to the Glacier Conference. Uh, the Glacier Conference is a, is a great opportunity to bring folks together uh, in Alaska. Once again, the, the idea is to, to highlight what's going on in, in the, the American Arctic. And we're very happy in Alaska that we're going to host so many visiting dignitaries and we're going to hopefully have some opportunity to share what's important in Alaska. I think very clearly the, uh, the State Department and, uh, and other leaders that will be in, uh, in session there will have things to talk about that are important to them, and so, so will Alaska. So I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to, to put our minds together to highlight what Alaska has and what Alaska doesn't have and look at, look at ways to, to go forward and to, uh, to evaluate climate, look at port infrastructure. We, ha we have a lot of things that we've talked about down through the years that are important, like the, uh, the concept of, or the need to build more icebreakers, for example, and, and we hope to hit on, on subjects like that, even though an icebreaker costs a billion dollars and nobody wants to pay for it. Uh, uh, Alaska is in, in desperate need for, for icebreaker capability for a wide variety of reasons, and so we hope to highlight issues like that. So I think uh, now, because of, uh, it's going to take place now because of the highlighting of the American Arctic, and uh, it's a very good thing. Permanent fund dividend. Um, I think the Alaska Permanent Fund was a great idea. I, I think it's fantastic, and not just because I get a $1,400 check or whatever it was, uh, but the, the concept really was to create a rainy day fund and an opportunity for Alaskans to have some uh, ownership in the the wealth that's generated by by oil and gas so i think that's a great thing i, I do think that uh, it would be much better served if we could put more money into it i think it'd be a terrific thing if we could get it to the point where the revenue generated by the investments uh, of the permanent fund could pay for government so we don't have the highs and lows that come with uh, with a commodity-based economy. I think if we get to that point, then Alaska will be in much better shape. Norway is a, a, is a good example of that where they have, uh, they started after us and they've, I think they put every dollar that they, the, of revenue that they generate uh, from oil, they put into that permanent fund and then they, they live off of a certain percentage. I think if we would have used that model, we probably would have had fewer highs and lows and we would be uh, our expenditures would be more sustainable, although we did hit some pretty high notes and spent a lot on, on infrastructure that we may not have otherwise been able to fund. Uh, the long-term benefits might have been great, but don't forget Alaska is a, is a relatively new state and we have, uh, we have a very small tax base and it's very, very expensive to pay for things. So 
uh, it's logical to understand why when you're starting to make billions of dollars on tax revenue that you would you would spend that some of it now and 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 invest less of it so I, I think that's a better solution what was the other whether North Dakota um, North Dakota doesn't want the Alaska model I think they have many more options that we don't. Uh, life is way cheap in, in North Dakota. It's a tiny state. Uh, I, I think they have a few more people than we do, if I remember right. Yeah, like they get like 11 more people than Alaska does. But their land base is tiny. They have a beautiful infrastructure network. They don't have to pay for the stuff that we do, and they don't have the, the time distance issues that we do. They certainly don't have 40 below zero that lasts for five months a year. And uh, although some people would say, Fargo or whatever that gets kind of chilly there. It's nothing like Alaska. They don't have the 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 problems that we do. So they have more options, and uh, I'm happy that they do whatever they want to do with theirs. But I, I think the permanent fund was a was a brilliant choice for Alaska, and uh, there are probably tweaks we could we could make to make it better. But I think it's it's good the way it is. Well, we've come to the end, and I think we've found that there are lots of challenges in the north. Um, Similar in Nunavut and Alaska and also different, but I think the government difference is also telling how the Canadian government deals with what is in a parliamentary system and what we have in, um, with Alaska and um, our federal government in Washington, D.C. I did put a publication out there on uh, the Canada Institute's One Issue, Two Voices series that looked at offshore oil development. And the conclusions of the authors there were very interesting. The Canadians really wanted the local population involved because of, of who was involved. And the Americans were kind of not so much that they wanted the local population. I think it was less Alaska and more to do with the, the Gulf of Mexico. But our people are slightly different. Um, our governments are different, but we have faced the similar challenges. Um, the Polar Initiative will move on from this and look at other parts of the Arctic relating to the questions. But um, please stay tuned. Sign up. Um, I think uh, we, we can put a sheet of paper if you haven't signed up or send us an email. Um, follow us on Twitter, and we really look forward to your participation in future events. Thank you for coming this morning.